Hello, this is one of a series of keynotes on online and blended learning uh, that I've prepared in collaboration with the Commonwealth of Learning and I'd like to thank them for their help with this. Uh, today I want to talk about 10 lessons for online learning from the COVID-19 experience. And these are based on research findings and how instructors, students and administrators responded to uh, the uh, pivot in the spring of 2020. And I'm hoping that by the time you see this, COVID-19 will have gone and we won't have to worry about it anymore. But I still think we will have learned some useful lessons from it as far as online learning is concerned. So I'm going to talk about very briefly the sources of the research and the limitations of the research. Uh, I'm going to go through the 10 lessons that I see uh, that we've learned um, during the summer, spring and summer and to some extent the fall of 2020. And then I'll come to some conclusions. This is based on 14 quick and dirty surveys between March and November 2020. Um, they're called quick and dirty because they have se severe limitations. They're not what you would might call f academic research. Uh, they're small, based on small convenient samples. For instance, uh, asking readers of journals to uh, fill in a questionnaire, for instance, or, re or, or members of a group uh, uh, to, to fill in uh, questionnaires. And it covers mainly the United States and Canada, so I'm not sure how well this will apply outside. And in most cases, because the numbers are small, uh, it, it's opinions rather than facts. Although the opinions may be quantified, so many people thought this, but it's still opinions rather than facts. By facts, I mean we don't have evidence necessarily of student learning outcomes as a result. Nevertheless, I found that Taken overall, these reports are useful and the findings are surprisingly, given the variety of sources, are fairly consistent in, in what they come up with. So overall, there were some very good responses in the higher education post-secondary system in North America to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. There was a lot of resilience showed by most universities and colleges. All higher education institutions in North America within two weeks moved to emergency remote learning. That is a fantastic effort. In Canada, that meant 100,000 instructors uh, moved their stuff online um, in two weeks. There were no strikes, there were no walkouts. And to be honest, the technology worked reasonably well. There wasn't huge crashes of servers and so on. So in terms of an emergency response, it worked very well. Also, over the summer, there was a big effort to uh, improve the quality of the online offering by training faculty, uh, not just in the use of the tools, but also how to, how to use the tools better for learning purposes. And this enabled both the uh, spring, summer and fall semesters to be saved for students. Students were able to complete them. Um, and we will see from the results that there were considerable improvements in the online offering in the fall semester compared with the spring semester. So it was a pretty good effort by everybody. And given the circumstances, I think it, uh, higher education institutions, instructors and students should be proud of what they were able to do. However, there are lots of things that weren't so good. Certainly in the spring, it was mainly online lectures. Best online practices often were ignored and students were unhappy. They were unhappy, interestingly, we'll see a little later, not so much about the learning, but about all the other things they missed from going to university or college. And in particular, the K-12, to the school sector, is still struggling as I speak in December, partly because of confused policy and messaging, um, surprisingly little help for teachers, school teachers, in moving online, and as a result, poor online pedagogy, not using online in the best way. So I think there's a big difference between the higher education post-secondary sector and the school sector here. And we could look at some of the reasons for that a little, little later. 
So the first lesson, uh, there was a rapid increase in online and blended learning. I think there will be a, a rapid increase in online and blended learning post-pandemic. Prior to COVID-19, faculty resistance was the main barrier to online learning. We knew that from uh, national surveys that many students, uh, many faculty were resistant to teaching online. As a result of COVID-19, nearly all faculty now have some experience. And of course, there's been a mixed reaction. Some instructors took to it like ducks to water. Uh, others hated it. And others weren't altogether happy, but were able to manage and actually learn something as a result. Many faculty received training in online learning over the summer, so their appreciation of its strengths and weaknesses is better. Students were using internet anyway before COVID-19, and now I think instructors are more aware of the potential that, uh, of getting students to use the internet can be for their teaching. So I suspect that many will incorporate online learning into their face-to-face -face and classroom teaching when we go back to whatever normal will be afterwards. Uh, here's a kind of conceptual gra uh, graph. This is based on Canadian data. Uh, up to about 2000, uh, 2020, uh, online enrollments were increasing at about a rate of about 10% per annum. And around about 2018, 10% of all credit course enrollments were fully online, in fully online courses. So it was a significant but small number of courses were fully online by 2020. Now, I think there will be an increase after 2020 because particularly in areas like professional master's programs, for instance, or maybe some of the uh, later courses in an undergraduate program, faculty and instructors will see a benefit in having some more courses fully online. But I, I think there's a market limit to how far fully online will go in the future. Um, it mainly appeals to Inde more independent learners, uh, older learners, learners in the workforce, uh, learners who I would call lifelong learners and so on. Um, it appeals to uh, single mothers, for instance, who can't go out to work but need, need to be at home to look after their children. And so there, there, there is a definite market which is still not fully exploited. And I think because dem demographically, student numbers are likely to drop as a result of the age differences and so on, that uh, numbers coming out of high school are going to go down slightly, certainly in Canada, there will be a push for these lifelong learners to fill the gap and also for international students. The big change, I think, is going to come with blended and hybrid. We didn't really know how many courses were hybrid before 2020. We knew about a third of courses, a third of institutions reported some blended learning. That's a mix of online and face-to-face. -face. I think after COVID-19, there will be a huge jump. I think instructors will find that using a learning management system particularly is very useful uh, for giving students activities and work to do. Students can do a lot of work online combined with face-to-face -face teaching. So I, I see that in, say, 10, 10 years, we'll probably have nearly all teaching will be a combination of either hybrid and blended learning or fully online, with very little just solely face-to-face -face teaching. The second lesson is that quality professional support for instructors is essential. There was an interesting study done by Nadia Nafi and colleagues uh, of Centers for Teaching and Learning. Uh, we knew beforehand that most instructors were unprepared for emergency remote learning and many sought help from centers for teaching and learning. Also, some, some institutions offered free online courses on how to teach online. For instance, the University of British Columbia had nine modules on how to go online with your teaching. Um, so there was a lot of uh, attempts to get help and not just plunge in blindly. And it, the, it, there were three areas of support that faculty were looking for. 
First of all, the use of key tools like Zoom and learning management systems. How do I use this? Um, online course design, and that came up especially over the summer um, when uh, Centers for Teaching and Learning worked very, very hard with many instructors to help them improve the course design so that uh, best practices in online learning could be incorporated into their uh, re emergency remote learning. A lot of work was done in trying to improve online lectures, make them more interactive. Online course design is a bigger shift than just improving online lectures. It's looking at all the other things you can do online besides lectures. But also there was an attempt to make online lectures um, more interactive, more focused, um, and take advantage, for instance, of the breakout rooms that you can have in Zoom for students to do work in small groups online and then come back into the main lecture. But there were big scaling issues. Um, as I said before, only 10% of courses were fully online and inst on, uh, instructional designers have been working primarily with um, probably 10% or less of instructors every year. Suddenly they had to provide support for 100% of the lectures. So scaling up, it wasn't that uh, we didn't know what to tell instructors to do. We did know that from previous experience with online learning, at least in Canada. But it was getting that knowledge out to um, all the instructors in a very, very short period of time that was the challenge. And that's because there's no comprehensive faculty development system in place. There's no requirement in most universities for faculty to take uh, professional development courses at least once a year, for instance. But in order to make best use of online learning, we need systematic training. Anybody who teaches online should go through at least a short course, maybe five to ten hours. It's not rocket science, but there is stuff to know before you go online. So we need more online training courses on how to do online and blended learning. And particularly we want short, just-in-time open education resources, like how to, how to uh, create a, a breakout group in Zoom, a little short video on how to do that that uh, instructors can log into when they need to use it. The third lesson is we can learn from some of the things that took place in emergency remote learning. Now, I want to emphasize that in most cases this is not what I would call quality online learning. It didn't follow the best practices that have been built up over 20 years previous experience in teaching fully online. They were often synchronous lectures. That means the students had to log in at the same time as the professor. Um, they were often interactive. There was nothing that the students were being asked to do other than watch and listen. Um, and quality online was really previously associated with the use of asynchronous tools such as a learning management system where students can log in at any time and where there are a lot of activities for students built into the learning management system which can be then monitored uh, or even assessed by the instructors. However, the use of Zoom was increasing before COVID-19. Um, instructors had found it to be an easy tool to use for, for online learning. So there are some good things about synchronous online learning and what we're learning uh, what that is good for. But one of the big problems was cognitive overload. We, we knew from research beforehand that students have a lot of problem uh, concentrating for more than 15 or 20 minutes if they don't have an activity to do. So they need to be redesigned for active learning. Uh, we need to identify the affordances of synchronous online learning. What can it do better than if the students can just download uh, the recording and use it whenever they want to? What are the advantages and are we using, uh, are we designing our synchronous uh, Zoom lectures to take advantage of those affordances? And also identify the affordances of asynchronous when students can go off and do activities, come back and so on. So both synchronous and asynchronous have value. My view overall is that asynchronous is going to be more important than synchronous. But we've learned from COVID-19 that there are some valuable things 
that we can build in in terms of synchronous learning for students. Lesson four, we need better 21st century assessment me methods. There was a lot of worries about invigilating online exams. How do we do this? And in fact, I know of at least one uh, national accreditation agency that would not accept um, online exams uh, for qualifications. So what they wanted was online proctoring, which is basically getting the students to do what they would do in a classroom, but doing at home on their computer with a camera uh, watching what they do. This was very intrusive and it led to privacy issues. One accreditation agency said that if a student leaves the room to go to the toilet, they had to take their um, webcam with them so they couldn't be seen cheating in the bathroom. Well, that is so intrusive and so wrong. Uh, and it's the wrong issue. It was trying to assess uh, in the 21st century in a 19th century way of paper and pencil tests done uh, on a computer. We need the way we change, uh, we need to change the way we assess learning. Allow online learning allows students' work to be continuously tracked. Um, and so you can have both formative and continuous assessment as students go. Um, the, you, you as an instructor can see what the students are doing while they're doing it. Um, now that might be intrusive, except they're in a learning management system which is walled off from everything else. And so there should be guaranteed privacy within that group for the students when they're working. Um, formative assessment is better too for measuring skills development. You can look at things like communication skills and critical thinking uh, as the students are working through the course. We can use tools such as blogs and e-portfolios and even blockchain to secure what students are doing and they can't go back and alter it for assessment purposes. Um, so we really need to rethink um, the, the, the way we assess students. Online learning can provide a, a richer source, uh, a, a richer ways of, of, of measuring learning and achievement. Lesson five, making innovative teaching stick. There were many examples of innovative teaching during COVID-19, but how far will they stick? How far will they go beyond the individual instructors and be adopted by other instructors to improve the quality of teaching? Contact North in Ontario has got a, an amazing project called Pockets of Innovation where instructors report on how they've been using technology for their teaching. And there are some really interesting, innovative uses of technology amongst those examples. But few of those go beyond the individual instructor. Few go beyond the instructor to other instructors in the same department even. There are a few that have gone across not only different departments, but across different institutions and been picked up by other institutions. But generally, institutions do not have a strategy for disseminating and supporting innovative teaching. So a lot of the things that were really interesting and innovative will have probably been lost through COVID-19 because we don't have the tools so I say an institutions need a strategy for encouraging innovation in teaching. Rewards and recognition for instructors who do this. We know that promotion is driven primarily by research. We need to give more rewards for innovative teaching. There needs to be a, a strategy for disseminating uh, good teaching within the institution through workshops, through, um, through uh, publicity within uh, social media within the institution and we need to put some funding aside to encourage innovation and innovation incidentally is not innovation for its own sake it needs to be linked to key teaching goals to assess which which innovations to support so that there should be some kind of evaluation system built in when a faculty member does something innovative. There should be some ways of measuring the impact of that. And I've got a couple of examples here. One is from Simon Fraser University Biological Sciences, where an instructor used a web-based tool to develop 
uh, uh, scientific argumentation skills. And that, she measured, measured the, the success of that and found it to be very successful. And it's a tool that could be used across a range of science subjects. Um, but you need an innovation strategy to make sure it gets beyond the individual instructor. Lesson six, multimedia and open education resources are underused. Most Zoom was for content de development rather than skills development. Instructors were doing the hard work. They were finding the information, organizing it, uh, make, making the arguments, delivering it. And students were relatively passive, absorbing this. We had few examples in emergency remote learning of the use of dynamic video, games or simulations, or other open education resources. Mainly because instructors just didn't have time to know about them. It's not a criticism of individual instructors. It's just something we should be looking at in the future. The problem is there's often a lack of good quality, easy to use multimedia open education resources, especially outside of the English language. Most open education resources look cheap and don't look very well produced in media terms and are often text-based. Our students are used to good quality multimedia. Even YouTube videos made at home um, are often very good on uh, YouTube. And we have to match those standards in education. So we need some national programs for OER development so that good quality resources can be shared across the system. A lot of material can be used from across many different uh, institutions and courses. Um, we don't have that great deal of varieties, particularly in the first and second year programs in post-secondary education, for instance. And give students the resources to learn. Um, let them go and find these resources on the net or direct them to them so that they can use these resources uh, as well as having your, your, your lectures. Probably the most important lesson for me that online access is still a problem for many students, even in advanced countries like Canada. Up to 25% of our students do not have adequate access to online learning. Uh, that's about 15% live in remote areas where they don't have high-speed internet access. They may have internet access, but for instance, it's not broadband enough to download a Zoom lecture, which requires at least 10 megabits. Many poor people don't have either the access because they can't afford the internet or they don't have the hardware uh, that's required. Or only, there's only enough hardware for one in the household and when one may be working from home and two may be studying, for instance. And so there's often crowded accommodation and multiple users of devices that can be a problem unless you have really high speed internet access into the home. So for a lot of people, um, normally online learning has been used to increase access. It's for students who couldn't get to campus. But we found through COVID-19 that there were students who had access to campus but didn't have access to the internet. So we need to focus on low bandwidth tools like learning management systems and email rather than on high bandwidth tools like Zoom. Uh, we need to improve internet coverage now. Canada, for instance, has a plan for covering the remote north, but it's not going to be implemented for another 10 years. That's not good enough. We need to get that money out and those systems put in place now. We need more local technology support centres. Contact North was able to support a lot of students in remote regions because they already had uh, support centres in small communities where students could go in and have a, a, a voluntary counsellor to advise them what courses to take, but also they had decent internet access that they could, act, that, that they could use. And we should give priority for the, to the poor, particularly in the K-12 sector, for on-campus teaching. So if we have to spread out students during a pandemic, it should be the ones that don't have access to the internet who should be given priority to come onto campus and do the rest of the teaching online. Lesson eight, we need more flexible learning spaces on campus. I've already mentioned that home is not always the best place for many students to learn. Um, 
Blended learning requires the integration of classrooms and online learning. Students need to bring their work and be able to demonstrate it in class, the work that they've done online. And we need more informal spaces on campus where students can go to a quiet area and study quietly on their own. Many libraries have those spaces, but we need them scattered all over a large campus, for instance, where students can have easy access to them. And I'm wondering what we're going to do with these large lecture classes even after COVID-19. Um, we realize now that putting 200 people or more in a room for an hour is not a good idea when there are viruses running around the community. Uh, even if COVID-19 goes away, we're going to have the flu and so on. So maybe we need to look at how we design smaller classroom spaces um, and how we can use that for interactive learning. And some institutions were already before COVID-19 designing um, interactive technology rich classrooms where students can sit around small tables where they can plug in their computers. Each table has a, a, a screen around the room uh, and the instructor has their own uh, console where they can also uh, put things up on all the screens if they wish. Um, and also breakout rooms where students can go and do some work on their own and come back into the group, for instance. So I think we're going to need some thought given to campus spaces. And particularly if we go to blended learning, do we need to build new big lecture halls in the future if, say, 25 to 30 to 40 percent of all teaching is going to be done online, even in campus-based institutions? So every institute, less than nine, is for in administrators because a lot of these issues go beyond the, the, the uh, ability of individual instructors to resolve. Every institution needs an overall digital learning strategy. Where are we going to be in five years time? What will our teaching look like? Every academic program, program as well as the institution really should be looking at its teaching and how it's going to be delivered over the next five years. Um, we also found that during COVID-19, advanced planning works. Those institutions that assumed that in May that they would have to go online in September, even though the COVID-19 rates were coming down, did much better in September in terms of student reporting, uh, instructors reporting on how things went well in September. The ones who left their planning for September to August um, did much worse, and that came out clearly from the research. Now, COVID-19 is going to work, go away, but we're going to have other things like bad weather that might, could close down campuses. We're going to have other flu um, viruses and other probably health problems that may require campuses to close. So you need a plan so, to be, so that you can be resilient and move easily from face-to-face -to, -face to online and back again. The other lesson that came out clearly that centres for teaching and learning were critical in this move to successful online learning. They need to be strengthened and fully supported. Um, however, there's a limit to how far you can increase the numbers of people working in centres for teaching and learning. We can't afford to have an instructional designer and a web designer working with every faculty member. We need to put in place training systems for faculty so that they don't need so much support and we can use the Centers for Teaching and Learning to create templates and models and resources that faculty can draw on. And I wonder about the end of the large lecture class. This is, in my view, not a good way to teach anyway. It's not a healthy way to teach. So do we need these large lecture classes? Can we find another way of organizing those big first year classes so that they're more interactive and students are learning in a safer an environment. And lastly, lesson 10, we need more data and more research. Radical changes are taking place, or maybe not. Maybe it's all going to go back to what it was before. But we, unless we measure it, we won't know. We need to know what proportion of teaching is fully online. Um, that's easier to measure, actually. 
What we don't know is what types of blended learning are being implemented. There are many different ways of doing blended learning. That's usually an individual instructor choice, and it's much harder to track that. But we need to track it. We need to know what forms of blended learning work and which were unsuccessful. And we need to know what, our, what the institutional plans are for digital learning and what's worked and what hasn't. The Canadian Digital Learning Research Association, before COVID-19, was tracking some of these questions. But it means institutions putting in place much more rigorous data collection about what they're doing in the, and what form their teaching is taking. So we need to know before and after COVID-19, are the learning outcomes better as a result? Who benefited and who lost as a result of the move to emergency remote late learning? Who's going to collect this data? We have institutional research departments that do that internally, but who's going to collect it nationally? Um, Canadian Digital Le Learning Research Association is a non-profit organization and its funding is very tenuous. We need regular national and statewide information to learn from each other so we can see the big picture. And in these two diagrams, you can see how the University of Ottawa um, tracked its growth in blended learning. It put its plan in several years ago and it's been monitoring how well that plan has rolled out. And this is a really useful tool for them that shows how many instructors have been trained, for instance. It, it, it gives them an idea of what they still have to do. And it also indicates how successful their online learning strategy and blended learning strategy has been. So in conclusion, never waste a good crisis. COVID-19 was an on unprecedented opportunity to improve the quality of teaching and learning by building on the changes occurring as a result of COVID-19. We've learned a lot about what works and what doesn't. What we need is a new normal where our institutions are stronger, better and more resilient as a result of the painful experience of COVID-19. To wrap up, um, I've given, there are some questions you can use, if you wish to, for general discussion. You can contact me there. Um, that's my website, and you can see more keynotes in, in this area uh, by going to the Cole YouTube channel. And that's a free online uh, book that I've written that covers a lot of these issues, uh, even though it's written pre-COVID-19. It's a free open textbook. Uh, it's available over the internet. Uh, and you can download it whenever you want. Thank you very much.